I want to open up, not with our scripture text, but with a scripture that is laid on my heart, and then we will go to our scripture text. But I think it's very applicable this morning, and I want each of us to listen to this and to consider, is this us? Consider, is the inside of our cup filthy? And look inwardly into ourselves this morning to really see where we are. Not where others are, not outside, but really where our heart is. And my prayer this morning is that God will show you where you are. And that you will make a decision to sincerely change and trust in Jesus this morning. It's in Matthew chapter 23. In verse 23, and Jesus is speaking about the same people he is speaking to here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the same concept. It deals with the heart. But Jesus was not very (laughs) nice here. He was very honest. We must be with ourselves as well. The 23rd verse of Matthew 23, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have to done and not leave the other undone. Jesus says, Ye blind gods, which strain at a gnat, and you swallow a camel. How many of us do that? We strain at small things. We're so worried about earthly small things, but yet, and just strain at those gnats, and yet we swallow camels. We're not spiritual at all. We're worried about fleshly things. 
Go to 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. He says it again, hypocrites. For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. He says outside your cup is clean and, and you appear to be righteous and you appear to be doing what you need to do, but your heart is dirty, your heart is wrong, inside you are filthy, inside you are spiritually dead, you are spiritually not where you need to be. Is that you this morning? Honestly, I hope the Holy Spirit will grab your heart. Go on. Thou blind Pharisee, blind Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, then the outside of them may be clean. Clean your heart first. Get spiritually right. Really ask God where you are. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he says it again. For ye are like unto whited uh, sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. How are you within spiritually? Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. Matthew five forty three through 48 that's where we'll be today. As we talk about a far-reaching love. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. And if we will stand as we read the Word of God this morning. In our scripture text. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Will y'all please join me with your heart and mind in a word of prayer to our God. Father in heaven, this morning, during this holy, sacred time, this time set aside to Open your word, Lord, let us open our hearts. God, let us not look at the outside of the cup and the outside of the platter this morning, Lord, but let us look inwardly into ourselves. Let the Holy Spirit uh, convict us and show us our unrighteousness without Jesus Christ. Let Him show us spiritually uh, where we are, God, if we will allow Him to. And Lord, I pray that this morning at Bethel Baptist Church, that we're not a church of fleshly people, but a church of spiritual men and spiritual women, spiritual children, God, for your kingdom. I pray this morning that you do a mighty work. We don't treat this as just another day, God, but a spiritual blessing. May we receive this morning. Just for this short time, God, change each and every one of our hearts, the saved and the unsaved. Convict us of sin. Humble us before your throne that we may be children of our Father, which is in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. We know Jesus is preaching the most famous sermon in all of Scripture to save people. The Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to kingdom subjects, those that has trusted Him as 
their Savior and teaching how they should live spiritually in this physical world. Not how they should live physically, but spiritually. The scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, as Jesus pointed them out, they were teaching this law, but they were teaching it wrong. I want to bring to your attention that during this time, these people were rather uneducated. The Hebrew language was not well known and well studied, only among the scholars, these scribes and these Pharisees. They were the one that was, were taking the Old Testament law, studying it, and then teaching it to people who could not read it themselves. And that's why they were teaching the law of God and teaching it to the letter of the law, but not to the spirit and the heart of the law. For the letter of law killeth, but the spirit gives life. It says in 2 Corinthians. So Jesus is teaching us the spirit and heart of what God meant in the Old Testament as these scribes and Pharisees are teaching it wrong. And in doing so, we see our state of unrighteousness before God. We see that we really are filthy. Inwardly, we are not clean. And inwardly, we need something else, and that is Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. Because we see that it's not just about following rule A and rule B, but yet it's our heart in following these things. It's an inward spiritual. This may be the hardest teaching of Jesus for kingdom subjects up to this point. I believe this is the hardest that we have gotten to so far. It has been for me. I believe it might be for you as well. You know, we have talked about hating your brother and adultery and divorce and oaths and even not retaliating. But I think loving our enemy is the hardest teaching this far for us as kingdom subjects to continually practice. This will take a very mature spiritual person. This will take one person that is guided to take people guided by the holy spirit in this spiritual kingdom you will not be able to do this on your own you will not be able to do this in your flesh you will fail miserably to love your enemy unless it's through jesus christ your lord and i want to elaborate a little more on that in a minute We learned the wrong way to retaliate last week. We turn the other cheek. We go the extra mile. We become generous and we give. We don't retaliate in an evil way. And now we learn how to retaliate. And that's by loving. That's by prayer. That's by blessing. I pray this morning that We will hear God's word. Nevertheless, no matter how difficult this teaching may be, no matter how hard it may be, no matter who that enemy is in your life, what that enemy has done, no matter if you want to be children of God, if you want to be spiritual subjects in God's kingdom, if you want to be a follower of Christ and to look like Christ, you must. Follow this teaching and love your enemy. Amen? Amen. You must put yourself away for yourself will not want to. You must put what you think is right and what is natural and you must fully submit to Jesus' teaching. You know, there is no time for us as God's children to continue to act like the world and be like the world. There is no time for us to continually to be babes and children in Christ, but to put away childish things and become a man and a woman of God. I hope you have not closed your heart already just by hearing Scripture, but I hope you will keep it open. We need a community, a nation, a world that even this the Sermon on the Mount that we have taken 
and will apply it to their everyday lives on how to live like kingdom subjects. This is not a time to just know you should pray for your enemy. Because I've said it many times. Guys, I say, let's pray for our enemy. Everybody says, amen. We know God's word says that. It's not a time to know it. It's a time to practice it. Amen? I believe this teaching, though, is the second step in loving others. I believe this step is for the spiritually mature, but yet we still falter on the first step. Jesus is talking to kingdom mature subjects here, but yet I feel like in churches today, in our local churches, among ourselves, we do not follow the first step which Jesus taught or God taught back in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12 to love our neighbor. For to love your enemy, to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, you must first love your neighbor. Amen? And I don't feel like we even do that as Christians. How in the world can we love our enemy if we won't love our neighbors? You know, you know notice Jesus said, it hath been said, not it hath been practiced. Did he say it hath been practiced, they love their neighbor, it hath been said. This is the second step. We must first learn to follow the first teachings. You know, I see way too many people who proclaim to be Christians who cannot love their neighbor, their family, or their fellow church members. And then we expect to love our enemies. We can't if we won't even love our neighbors and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ first. Amen. You might need to go back today and pray that God will give you, pray maybe that God will save you and, give you a, and forgive you of your sins so you will realize what forgiveness and love really is. Change your heart, turn you around. And when you've been shown love and forgiveness of God, you may show that to others and then you can start loving your enemy. Even the lost man and the heathen can love their neighbor, God says. How much more should the children of God? But I don't, have to raise, I don't have to ask you to raise your hands. I don't have to ask you to take a poll. You know you've been in church long enough. You've been around Christian people long enough. There's a problem with loving each other inside the local church, is there not? And it should not be so. We must ask God to change our heart and clean the inside of our cup this morning. John 13, 34 and 35, we all know what that says. The new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men, all Paris, know that you are my disciples, that ye have love one another. For another. That's how people know that you are a child of God. That you are a child of your Father in heaven. Not only loving one another, but loving our enemies. It hath been said, it says in verse 43, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. And this comes from Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbors as thyself, for I am the Lord. He tells the people of Israel in the law, Thou shalt love your neighbor. And surely to be a nation and to be a society, a successful society, there must be love between people. For a society to run, for things to go anywhere, there must be some sort of love between people of that society. Amen? That's why God gave the law. He knew knew that. Without love between people, it would be total chaos and we would destroy ourselves. (laughs) We would poke out each other's eye and retaliate until the whole world was blind. 
the scribes and the Pharisees, they did not argue this law that thou shalt love thy neighbor. They just defined thy neighbor a little differently. You know who their neighbor was? They taught their neighbor was the Jew, and that's it. So uh, people like their selves. Maybe it was the, your own family. Maybe it's your own, y- your own clique. Maybe it's the, your own little group that you only love them. So the Jews were teaching to love your neighbor, the Jews or the people close to you, but that they were teaching to hate your enemy, the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Samaritans, people unlike you and outside of your little circle. So the problem was not, well, the problem even was in teaching them to love your, their neighbor. For who did Jesus say their neighbor was? Because the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus once, and they asked, who's your neighbor? Do you remember the beautiful picture that Jesus gave and the story that he told? Anybody? How about there was a man on a road, and he was in dire need of help. And it said a couple of Jews came by, a priest, right? These people came by and they left him there in need of help. But then the people they're supposed to hate, the Samaritans, well, a Samaritan came by, didn't he? A Samaritan picked him up, took him to an inn, and said, I'll cover his hotel fee. He says, that's... And, he, and then he, he, didn't even, he, he asked them, he asked the scribes, he asked the Pharisees, who do you say the neighbor was there? <laughs> and they got pretty upset with him, didn't they? Our neighbor is anyone that we might come in contact with. It's debated exactly, because you know what? I don't know how many of you have studied the law. You cannot find in the law anywhere where it tells you to hate your enemy. It is not in there. Somebody find it and come present it to me, because it does not say hate your enemy in the law. Maybe the Pharisees were saying, well, if God said love your neighbor, maybe the opposite must be true to hate your enemy. Maybe they got it from Deuteronomy 23, 6. It says, Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. You see, Israel at this time, that when they had came out of Egypt, there were some evil, very evil nations, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And they did not help Israel a bit when they came out of Israel, when they came out of Egypt. They did not feed them. They did not give them drink. They actually hired a a very famous cursor named Balaam to curse them. But they were people of God, and God protected them because He loved them. But yet, they also sent somebody in there to turn Israel's heart away, and 14,000 were slain. It was just a bad mess. So God tells the people of Israel... With these Moabites and Ammonites, you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. God was talking about the, these enemies, Moabites and Ammonites of Israel. It was for their protection. And God knew the evil hearts of these people. He was not teaching to hate your everyday enemy. He was protecting the people of Israel. All throughout the Old Testament, does he not say, do not take their daughters, do not take their sons, do not intertwine with enemy nations because of their idolatry and how evil they are? Does he not? I won't read it, Ezra 9.12 says it. But it had nothing to do with hating your everyday enemy. We have no idea where these scribes and Pharisees got this teaching, but yet they taught it. Well, I know where they got it. For we get a lot of things that we believe today are on sinful hearts, <laughs> isn't it? So, but there is an enemy. Before I go on to, I say unto you, you there is an enemy you should hate. There is something you should hate, and an enemy you should hate. That enemy, Satan. 
his schemes, his ways, and sin, you must hate them. Hate, H-A-T-E capital. Christian, it's okay for you to hate sin. Actually, we need a people that will hate sin more. We're not a people that hate sin. We're a nation that loves it. You must learn to hate sin before you can ever learn to follow God. Does that make sense? For it's a hatred of sin that shows how can you not hate sin? For if you love sin or even play with sin... You should never seek peace, prosperity with these or with, your, or with Satan. You must battle daily with your enemy, Satan, and you must hate sin. So that is an enemy you must hate, but obviously it's not our everyday enemy. So the Pharisees were uh, completely misunderstanding these teachings. And this is referring to people who might be against you. Always looking for your demise. People who just do not like anything about you. And you know who I'm talking about, do you not? When I say your enemy, I want you to think of that person in your mind right now. Or those people. I don't want you to point them out or yell their name. I want you to think of them, and you know who they are. They just came in your mind. Those people who want the worst for you or your demise, or you consider your enemy, and I hopefully, I hope to God it was not a fellow church member. For that comes in where we must love those who love us. That comes with loving our neighbor that we should do initially. That does not come with loving your enemy because our church member is not our enemy. You see how wicked we are? Who is that enemy in your mind? Keep it in your mind while we talk about how you should love them. This is where loving... And now I want you to learn and practice what Jesus tells us we should do concerning these people that you hate. Or that is your enemy. I say unto you in verse 44, But I say unto you, Jesus says, Love your enemies. Very simple. Very to the point, love that person you thought of that's in your mind that you consider an enemy. Love them. So what does that look like? Really, what does it mean to love your enemy? We can say it all day, but what does that mean? How about love suffers long? How about... Love is kind, and it does not envy. This is all towards your enemy. Love does not lift up itself, and love is not puffed up. It does not, love does not behave itself unseemingly. Love does not seek her own. It's not easily provoked. It does not think any evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, But it rejoices in the truth. Love beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. And love never fails. That is the love you are to have towards your enemies. It means to forgive them and keep forgiving It means not to rejoice in their shortfalls or shortcomings. Are you looking inside your cup this morning? That's why I read that passage. Are you looking at your platter? Are you looking at the sepulchers? Is there dead bones in there or is it clean? It means not to rejoice in the the, uh, downfall and shortcomings of others. Proverbs 24, 17, 18 says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it and displease him, and he turns away his wrath from him. 
So we don't rejoice in our enemy's shortfall or when our enemies stumble or when our enemy, something bad happens to our enemy. But how often do we find happiness when bad things happen to our enemies? Huh? They deserved it, didn't they? They had it coming. <laughs> They've been living so evil. They've been my enemy for a long time. Well, they had it coming. Thank you, God, for sending judgment upon them. Has that ever been us? Or is that us right now? You know, David did pray to God for destroying his enemies. But you know what the thing with David? He was not upset at what they were doing to him. Does that make sense? He did not say, God, these people are doing evil to me. They're my enemy. Lord, destroy them. He was praying for the enemies of God that were trying to destroy God. He was praying for people that were talking against God. And that was not in the law, obviously. They deserved it. They had it coming. We say that so often, but that is not should not be our heart as kingdom subjects. It says, bless them that curse you, Jesus says next. The people that talk bad about you and try to slander your name. You got anybody out there trying to slander your name? Make your name bad? Do not in turn talk bad about these people that curse you, but bless them. Don't talk bad about the people that slander your name, but speak good about them. You know, this might be a conversation you have, for example. He comes up and says, You know, Brother David? Is anybody in here named Fred? Okay, good. You know, Brother David? Fred was talking about you the other day. How you're good for nothing. All right, so that happens a lot, doesn't it? Come on, oh, such and such was talking about you and how you're good for nothing. And he, Now, this isn't Brother David's natural response. He's a man of God, but here's a response of regular people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wouldn't pour water on Fred if he was on fire. No good for nothing. He didn't work today in his life. Who's he talk about me? Did you hear what Fred did the other day? That's what we usually do, isn't it? But here's what Jesus says to do. He might have said that. And you, you say, oh, that's so silly, Dylan. He might have said that, but I forgive him. He might even mean it. I don't know, but. He's a hard-working man. Find something good to say about him. And then move on. You don't curse them that curse you, do you? That's an everyday situation. You, 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 you're not good for nothing, Brother, Day, Brother uh, Johnson. I promise. I really, I really love you. You, you really not. Nobody thinks that. I, please don't. I'm sorry for using you there. But talk about humbling yourself when somebody it talks right about you and how you should respond. Go on. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. We must seek opportunities to do good to those who do bad to us. Wow. Talk about a concept. Maybe our enemy is sick. Good for them. No. Make them some soup. Send them a card. Go mow their yard for them. Maybe they're going through a building project or their car is, is, is something's wrong with it or I don't know. There's something in their life. Seek an opportunity to, to, to do good for them. For if you want to be a kingdom subject and a follower of Christ, you must. You must. Exodus in the law gives us some examples. 23 Verse 4 and 5, you can write it down. It's an interesting deal. It says, if you meet uh, your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. 
If you see something of your enemies lost, his onky, his onky, his ox or his donkey going astray, you bring it back to him. You don't say, oh, that's Fred's. <laughs> I hope it never gets found. Maybe that's their cows out on the road. I don't know. That's, we have a lot of cows around here. If thou see the donkey of him that hateth lying under his burden and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Maybe you see something of your enemies that needs help. You don't leave it there, but you help them. That is what you should do. Proverbs 25, 21, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. You still got that person in your head? That enemy? This is what you should do for them. Jesus goes on to say, Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So instead of plotting revenge, instead of building up anger inside your heart for them, you Pray for your enemy. You do not pray that their brakes go out going down a hill. You don't pray that their air conditioning goes out this summer. You don't pray for their demise, but you pray for their success. You pray for their spiritual state. You pray for yourself to handle them in a loving and Christ-like way. Can we read that together if you are in Matthew 5, verse 44? Because it's very hard. I'm going to be reading, pray for them which despitefully. Are you ready? Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Use you. And persecute you. We are to pray for those people. Verse 46 says, For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. It is easy to love those that love you. The whole world can love people who love them. Even the heathen does. It's easy even for lost people to love those who love them. If we are only loving our neighbor, if we're only loving our fellow church member, we are no different than the world. Is that not odd? If we only love our neighbor, we are no different than the world. Is that not odd to think about? Jesus says, If you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. We think we're really doing something when we love each other and our neighbor. And we are. We're being obedient to Jesus' command, but we're only being half obedient. So we must also love our enemy. <laughs> we say, oh, I am so righteous and good. I'm loving everybody around me, the people that love me, but you're no better than the publican. We are only being partially obedient to Jesus' command if we only greet our brethren in CVs. Only greet the people that we know and that we love. But boy, if we see our enemy, we try to duck the other aisle. Or we, we say, how are you doing with hate in our heart? And we, can you believe that they had the audacity to look at me like, you know, how we do. Love those that love us. There's no reward in that. The title of this message was what? Does anybody know? Remember? A far-reaching love. It's not far-reaching when you only love people that love you. It's a short-reaching love. It's not a far-reaching love. We must rise above the standard, Christian kingdom subject. We must rise above the norm. We must love our enemy as well. 
It is a witness to others when our love is farther reaching than the love of them or the love of the world. We stand out, we're different, we allow our, we allow our light to shine, and we then are being the salt of the earth. When others see kingdom subjects, not only love those who love them, but love their enemies, it is a strong and convicting witness. Amen? Big things will happen for the kingdom of God when others witness Christians loving like God does. I want to tell a story of three kind of dogs. Anybody in here like dogs? In my opinion, there's three kind of dogs. Thank you, D uh, Dallin. There's three kind of dogs. I think you'll agree with me. The first kind of dog is the dog that loves everyone. It's the dog when the owner comes home and the owner forgot to feed the dog that morning. The dog still wags its tail and loves the owner. It's the dog where you, for, you accidentally closed the, him up in the laundry room for 10 hours and you come home and open it up and guess what? The dog jumps on you and glad you're home. It's the dog that when you take to the park or out in public that the dog wags its tail at every visitor that comes by and every guest and everybody can pet that dog. It's the dog that is sweet and kind to everyone. Do we know that dog? Miss Carolyn says she's got one. The dog, when guests come and kids come, the, the, they love the guests. Then there's dog number two. There's a dog that is a protector of the family. Loves their family, loves the household. Loyal to them. But then when the mailman comes and the UPS man knocks on your door. Roar! Right? Or when a guest comes in, you better not touch that dog, he'll snap at you. You take him outside in public and to the park, and the, and the dog does not like anybody else but the one that's tugging the dog on the leash. Anybody know that dog? And Carolyn had one of those. And then we've got dog number three. The dog that hates everyone. A dog, he's been abused all his life and mistreated. He doesn't trust anybody. He bites and claws and won't even take food out of anybody's hand because he's been mistreated all his life. He's in the pound and he just needs somebody to love. Everybody know that kind of dog? <laughs> but those are... Three kind of dogs, but I think those are three kind of people as well. I think most Christians and people are dog B. They love their enemy, they love their, their, their family and the ones that are for them and they're a protector of them and they're on their side, but anybody else, the UPS man, the, the somebody knock on the door, uh, somebody else come, boy, they, they, there's no love there. That's most people. Okay, then there's the third dog who hates everybody, you know, and that's a few people, but you know how they should be treated? I've seen these dogs come into a loving home, and though the dog would bite at first and the dog had no trust, the more love that was shown, the more, uh, the, the more consistency in that treating the dog right, the dog would finally begin to trust the owner and begin to love them. And begin to love others. So there's some dog number threes out there that you need to love. But dog A is how Christians should be. They not only love their owner, their family, when their family forgets to feed them. Or accidentally locks them in a closet. Or does something rudiment, just very small to them. They continue to love, but they not only love their family, but they love everybody else. That they wag their tail around everybody that they come and contact. They're happy to see them. How are you? That's how the Christian should be. You know why dogs are so loved? Because they love people. 
It, it don't, they don't matter what happens to the dog. It loves you. And you love it. Because it loves you regardless of what happens. Doesn't it? That's why people love dogs. And that should be a kingdom subject. You love people no matter what. But we, yet we want to be dog B. Love is the only thing that can turn an enemy into a friend. Martin Luther King Jr. said. Lastly, in verse 48, it says this in 45, that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sinneth rain on the just and on the unjust. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Jesus tells us that God gives. And y'all don't check out quite yet, please. Just because I said lastly. Jesus tells us that God gives both good and bad gifts, or both good gifts to evil and good. The sun and the rain are good gifts God gives, okay? He's saying God makes it the sun shine and He gives rain to bad and good, just and unjust. He says he is not a, God is not a respecter of person, and God gives good to both. How much more should we if our Heavenly Father gives good gifts to both, just and unjust? Amen? God is not a respecter of person. God lo- Listen to this. God, and that's going to be my point in my closing, God loves His enemies as well as His children. He sent His Son to die for His enemies. You know, here, here's a problem with Christianity. We think of God and as the gospel as God sitting in heaven looking at the good and bad things people do and shelling out blessings to the good deeds and pouring out wrath to the bad deeds. And that's not the God of the Bible. That makes sense? We try to please God by our good works so He'll bless us. And we try to refrain from bad so He won't curse us. But God, but the Bible just says God gives good gifts to both just and, un- and unjust. Good and bad. For every good and perfect gift is from above. He'll pull out His wrath and judgment in eternity. It's only by the grace of God that we are any good. For there's God gives common grace, and it's shed upon all men. Not saving grace, but common grace is. All men have ample opportunity by the common grace of God to accept the saving grace of God. If God gives good to bad and good, just and unjust, how much more should we Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay them. We see just succeed all the time, or unjust succeed all the time. We say, well, we want to be like them because they succeed. But God says, no, it's better if you will just fear me and do right. We're talking about that in Ecclesiastes. We must be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect. Blameless, mature, and of the highest integrity. The world must have no doubt when they see us who our King is and who our Heavenly Father is. They must see and declare they are a child of God by the love we have for our neighbor and our enemies. In closing, if you will please turn your Bibles to 1 John 4, 7. It wraps it all up. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not is not saved, knows not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us and you, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us 
and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If you are not saved here today, you are an enemy of God. Do you realize that? James says, Whosoever will be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. If you are lost and not saved, you're an enemy with God. You love the world, you love the things of the world. Your flesh and your eyes lust and the pride of life eat you up. This is, this is the truth. This is looking inside your cup right now. Looking inside your heart, not at the outside, but at the inside. If you do not know Jesus, you're an enemy. You hate the things of God, and you are living in continual sin. Look inside your cup. You are a lover of your own self and of sin, and you are not of God, and you are not of His Son, Jesus. There is no love found in you. There is just enmity with God. You are dirty. You are rolling around in the mud pit of sin and rejection of God. And you stand an enemy. You care not to humble yourself before your Creator, nor call out to Him for forgiveness of sin and restoration back to Him. You stand an enemy of God. Despite your circumstances and current state right now, despite you being an enemy, God still loves you. Because God not only loves those that love Him, but God loves His enemies and those that are lost. And He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you right where you are right now. No matter how filthy you may be. So are you an enemy of God today and in need of salvation? As we all stand and our musician and song leader comes forward, musicians and song leader come forward. There is no in between, guys. There is no I'm a... You're either a friend of God or you're an enemy with God. There is no in-between. I'm kind of God's friend. You're either saved or unsaved. And an unsaved person stands as an enemy with God, and in your heart it is wicked. There is no good thing. There dwelleth no good thing. And there is no forgiveness of sin. No, no blood of Jesus Christ that's covering your sins if you're lost. But today you can accept the free gift of salvation of God's grace, of the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, that died for your sins and took all those sins upon Him, died with those, resurrected, conquered those sins, and now says, if you will just have faith in me, that you will be justified. This morning, are you an enemy of God? Will you become a friend of God? today.